Welcome to the Civic Tech Tech for Social Impact event. Uh, apologies for the delay. There's one thing we know for sure is that there will be technical issues. So we'll uh, can't really make up time, but we'll uh, go through and plow into it now. So I am Ross Dawson, a futurist, entrepreneur, and today the moderator of this fine event. Delighted to have you all on board. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we sit. For many of us, for myself, it is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd like to pay respects to the elders, past, present, and future of the Aboriginal peoples of the lands of everyone who is participating in this event. So the purpose of this event is simply to tap the extraordinary potential of civic tech in Australia. Now, more than ever, technology can and must be used to enhance government and society and democracy. And this means investment, investment, of course, financially, the investment of time, of energy, of governments who understand the importance and set the policies that will create this. And so all of the civic tech initiatives which can create the potential which we all understand must have financial sustainability, which means commercial models. And that's a lot of what today is about is understanding. How do we build a sustainable commercial models for civic technology? So this event is organized by the Center for Civic Innovation, which is founded by Amelia Loy, who I think uh, many of you know. And she will say a little bit about um, the Center for Civic Innovation later, but just firstly, as myself, as a non-executive director of the Center for Civic Innovation, I'd like to share, I suppose, my perspective on it, which is that technology is an extraordinary enabler and the biggest, most important issues that face us is how we are structured as a society, the relative roles of governments and citizens. And I believe that they, they shouldn't be delineated and different. We need to all together be participating in creating the society that we want. And civic technology is the primary route to that. And I think in this last month or two has pointed to the potential and the importance of civic technology, in particularly in creating a future of democracy that we all want. So in the, the idea of the Center for Civic Innovation is that everyone has the potential for the ideas and the energy. And so as an organization wanting to tap that, how do we bring forth and catalyze and tap that potential? So I'd like to just look quickly at the, uh, what we have in store for today. So we have uh, beginning with a global panel of extraordinary experts uh, from US and UK, some Australian experts to share their perspectives on the Australian scene. Go on to have a world cafe where founders of civic tech startups or organizations where you can go in and hear from their experiences, learn from them, learn with them, have conversations and build them. And finally, we'll have some announcements on some important initiatives that is going to help drive civic tech in Australia moving forward. So just want to quickly uh, show that there are instructions. So we have limited time, but we will have questions uh, throughout. So there is a Q&A icon, which you'll be able to see if you scroll over or tap your screen, you will see a Q&A icon. So if you are addressing your question to a particular person, please put that person's name, put your question in and uh, we'll feel those. We won't have time to answer all of your questions, but we will take all of your questions and try to get the answers for everybody as we go. And also note that there is a chat. Uh, chat will be just if you want to have conversation with your guests, but that will also be a place for the World Cafes and the links. We'll give you the instructions for that part of that uh, later. And just very important to know that after the World Cafe, please do come back to this main session for announcements at the end, there are some important things which are going to be critical for helping develop civic technology in Australia moving forward. So this is a very fast pace. I'll ask speakers to all keep the time. We won't be able to answer your questions. And also just note that this session is being recorded. So just uh, be, be aware of that as we go. So we'd like to move on to our, quickly, to our global panel. And uh, we like to just have some brief presentation from each of those first, and then going on to some questions. So I'd first like to introduce uh, Jago Pashotto, who's a senior public sector specialist at the World Bank, who has 18 years of experience in uh, being able to drive civic technology initiatives. So please uh, just uh, hand over to Tiago now.
Well, um, hello to everybody. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot uh, to the Center of Civic Innovation for this invitation. <laughs> I'm going to try to be uh, very brief uh, um, and um, talk a bit about civic tech and thinking a bit about business models. I'm going to raise just three points. Um, first of all, I need to state that my background on civic tech uh, comes from a participatory democracy perspective and public accountability, so less about social innovation. I mean, at some point we can talk about these differences and if they're important or not. And um, of course, there's the elephant in the room, which is also the uh, coronavirus um, situation, in which I try to address maybe how does it change the landscape of civic tech. So uh, starting from a democratic governance uh, perspective, uh, one of the big things that uh, might be one of the next challenges of civic tech, it is protests. Right? Protest is one of the things that, whether we like it or not, it's needed uh, on, on, on the democratic uh, space. So some of the questions that I think that are important for those working with civic tech right now, it is, what will protests look like if social distancing becomes more frequent than we think, right? What tools can we think that make online collective action more visible than, for instance, e-petitions, all right? And how do we combine uh, these online activities with offline action that may not require, uh, that in which social distancing is still valid? So think about boycotting, right? Boycotting products and issues like this, in which you can just stop buying something, it's a type of offline action, but you're still uh, engaging. And uh, why do I think there's a, there's a business model for that? If you look at change.org, for example, that's part of their business model and they're pretty, they do uh, pretty good because there are more and more organizations who need support that will be needing support to create this form of uh, collective uh, engagement. So the first thing that I think we should be looking at where there's a potential niche, it is about how to foster collective action uh, considering that social distancing might be here uh, for a long time. Um, second thing is civic tech. Normally we think of citizens, but uh, another area, if I was investing my money, let's say uh, on, on civic tech, uh, I'll be looking actually into parliaments. Right? I mean, we can do all the civic tech that, you, that we want, but if parliaments cannot function, uh, democracy crumbles, right? And what we see right now is that parliaments, many of them are totally stopped from working. And uh, I can say because I get lots of governments contacting me and they're looking for solutions so that they can start working, working remotely, voting, collaborating on documents and issues like this. And the tools, the right tools are not yet there, not the good ones and not in a structured manner. And I would say there's probably lots of money in there uh, to be, lots of business models in there to be raised. And the good thing about this is that once you, if you solve this problem, you might also be solving the problem of other types of participatory democracy, so to speak, that will need these tools. I work, uh, I, I advise the global hub on participatory budgeting, which is a practice that exists in over 2000 cities. Uh, but that normally relied on people meeting physically, right, to decide where the, the government's budget should be going. And right now, these initiatives as well are stopped. And both governments and citizens and organizations and funders are looking like for solutions on how we can be doing that. So I think there, there is another area where we can have uh, sustainable business models, right, working first with parliaments probably, and then... Uh, plugging into other existing participatory initiatives that have had been blossoming uh, prior to uh, the pandemics. Um, my third point is not about uh, coronavirus or coronavirus related, but um, that is um, that I think it's important, was important before, and it's going to be uh, keep on being important. It is um, Lots of the civic tech businesses that exist nowadays and that have a sustainable business model, um, I wouldn't say all of them, but I'll risk to say the majority with a few exceptions, uh, they rely on government contracts. And right? so they're selling businesses to the government. Otherwise, they are depending on grants. Right? But those who, can, uh, who are sustainable, I'd say lots of them rely on, 
on government contracts, or at least part of their of their sustainability uh, is owed to them. So this brings to uh, an issue that it is about public procurement, the way the government does contracts. Most governments in the world, and I would say probably in Australia, uh, might not be different. The procurement models uh, have been established that it's great to procure roads, bridges, and trucks, right? but it's it's not really good when it comes to procuring uh, civic tech innovation. So one of the things that I say is that governments, if governments stopped doing hackathons and they started just to improve their public procurement, probably civic tech would be in a much better shape. So I would finish with that. Uh, so for those who are uh, working with civic tech and they're de dedicating part of their energy uh, to civic tech solutions, also dedicate part of your energy to uh, proposing reforms in public procurement in a way that it's more amenable for civic tech initiatives to benefit from government contracts and to have more sustainable business models. But I'll stop here and I look forward to the discussion. Fantastic, thank you very much, uh, Thiago. So over to Rebecca. Can you see me and hear me? Hi everyone, uh, I'm back. I'm head of research at a civic tech organization called My Society in the UK. We were one of the first civic tech groups in the world. Um, we actually started out as um, an organization that helped people to find the fax numbers for their members of parliament. So that's kind of how long we've been doing civic technology. Um, we have been mostly working with local government and national governments over the years, um, developing tools that in some way help citizens hold their governments and their institutions to account. Um, that could be at a local level um, when it's in, you know, in terms of co contacting local government about local issues like community stuff, place-based things, issues that um, need to be dealt with or at national level, which is more about holding parliament to account, contacting your members of parliament, um, and also looking at transparency issues like freedom of information um, and other themes like that. So in terms of sustainability, um, it's quite useful actually that I've uh, come after Tiago because obviously he's left off with uh, the discussion about procurement, which is, is something that we've had to deal with a lot as we've matured. Um, as a civic tech organization about 10, 15 years ago, um, we were very much focused on building tools outside of government. So building things that were very useful for normal people to access and understand, um, but that sat very much on the outside trying to kind of push information into government about what needed to be done or what people needed um, to, to have access to. Over the years, you know, we very much realized that we needed to close that feedback loop more effectively. Um, it wasn't going to be useful for people just to use a tool that was great on the outside, but actually because it didn't fit with a lot of institutional functions, um, people weren't getting the kind of quality responses um, and closure of the feedback loop that they really needed. So over the last 10 years, we've massively increased our work with local and, and national governments. Um, to not only make sure that we have great tools and great interfaces on the outside for, for users, but the, the information that's coming through those platforms is actually integrating far better at the back end into either parliament or, or local government or whichever institution it's concerned with. Um, that has obviously required us to work much more heavily um, with institutions themselves um, and you know, for us to persuade them that actually this is a good thing for them, that having small things that can plug straight into workflows um, actually reduces the amount of admin required in dealing um, with the kind of issues that are brought through uh, civic tech tools. So there's a sustainability model there that we have developed around some of our place-based uh, services like Fix My Street, for instance, um, where we're actually interacting far more now with local councils um, as a result of having high volumes of, of traffic through those services. 
the other thing we're doing a lot in terms of our sustainability is actually working with institutions at a far more kind of structural level um, and we do this all around the world actually I mean our software is open source it can be picked up and used anywhere uh, but we do tend to work with groups on the ground in about 40 or 50 countries that they want to use the software to, to plug it in uh, to their territories but what we're trying to do is make sure that the data standards and the data landscape in those places is actually sufficient for those things to work because it's actually quite easy to to build a really kind of shiny exciting civic tech tool um, but if there's not reliable solid data to kind of build it on top of and to make sure that it's maintained then those things quickly fall out of use um, so one of the things especially with parliaments that we're doing is trying to kind of audit their internal capacity their internal processes their expertise um, and the kind of data access landscape outside to, uh, to normal citizens so that they can actually improve the, the quality of the data that they're doing, the quality of their record keeping digitally um, and migrate them onto more sustainable um, data work paths. So that kind of work is very much kind of embedding civic tech kind of principles and ideals into institutions that, as Tiago said before me, whether it's in terms of procurement or whether it's just in terms of IT infrastructure that they're not very familiar with. Um, this represents massive change, but it's something that we hope that makes civic technology a lot more sustainable in the future. Um, because even if institutions are doing um, just good data work, it means there are far, far more opportunities as civic technologists we can take advantage of um, because there is good quality data. Um, and this is, I think, going to be a lot more important going forward. Obviously, Tiago just mentioned the, uh, the coronavirus issues that you know, are affecting the whole world right now. The migration to doing things online has been very, you know, very kind of jarring, I think, for a lot of organizations. But once we emerge from this crisis, I suspect that we will return very quickly to looking at the climate crisis that an awful lot of people have been have been pushing that agenda as well. And that will also require us to look more effectively at what can be done online, um, how we reduce emissions, how we reduce travel. Um, so I think this period now is, is going to become a good argument. manage to carry on their jobs uh, during lockdown uh, conditions so actually why are we not pushing this as a working model far, far more uh, effectively in the future as a as one way of reducing emissions so again I think there is a lot of opportunity for civic technology groups um, in terms of working with institutions in terms of embedding the principles and in terms of pushing um, a good way to work digitally because we are actually you know this community here um, is, is the best at that um, and that's what I think you may, you need to sell a lot more powerfully as well that, that actually we we do this best we've already been doing it for years um, so make sure you include that as part of your pitches I guess so I'll just wrap up there thank you Tiago and thank you Rebecca so please uh, anybody uh, put your questions in Q&A for Tiago and Rebecca and the other panelists. So I suppose my, my first question to both of you is, civic technology has been around for a long time and both of you have been driving that uh, globally. So what is it that you think needs to happen, I suppose, particularly in the context that we have today in order to be able to, I suppose, broaden the impact, broaden the partic participation, broaden the visibility of, of uh, civic technology. And so we've been doing extraordinary things, I believe now is a massive opportunity to push that further. What is it that you can, what, what can be done now? What can we all do in order to be able to put civic technology into a far accelerator? So perhaps Tiago first, if you have any thoughts on that. Um, so, I mean, I think the first thing that we need to do is to re stop reinventing the wheel. Uh, one of the things that I'm saying is, I, I think in the last two to three days, I got, uh, three or four lists of all civic tech initiatives uh, under COVID. Uh, I think there are hundreds of them. Um, and they, it, it is just too much. And lots of it, it's like people reinventing the same tools or like with a small 
things. If you look these tools, they boil down to four or five, uh, four or five um, uh, functions, so to speak, right? So there's lots of energy being wasted on building tools and maybe not building relationships. So I think right now it is the moment instead of like focusing on tools, maybe, uh, even though I was advocating for some tools before, but there's also about uh, building some relationships. Uh, I think one of the work, for instance, like people like my society uh, has been extremely strong in doing and uh, what I see here in my work, by the way, I'm based in Mozambique, so I work with uh, four or five countries in the region. Um, the, the tools that, that most we need, they are already there. But what is the most difficult, it is to get the government on board and have governments understanding what are the benefits for this. But when you use a certain tool, just let's say, for example, in our context, on citizens reporting medicines talk out, right? Um, it is not about just putting the tool there and having all the, all the messages coming about stock out in health center number 72, but it is about how, what's the mechanism on the background uh, that you make that the government can be responsive to that, for instance, and send medicines to that, to that place. So um, the, the question here that I'd say is that what we can do is uh, particularly under the situation and start to engage with government creatively. Um, while understanding that governments are overwhelmed with the response, but uh, it is passing a message that we are there to help and to reduce the burden to them, not to increase the burden and to engage creatively in a dialogue. That's what I would be doing now. And that's actually what we're doing and what I'll keep on doing today for the rest of the day and for the foreseeable future. I'll stop. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Thiago. And so Rebecca, I mean, my, my side is a wonderful example. Start in UK, now open source, global impact. How do you ramp it up from here? Um, I think, as I was saying uh, in, in my original talk, I think for me, a lot of it, a lot of the work to be done is, is about embedding. Um, so less the proliferation of lots and lots and lots of tools and more about, I mean, again, echoing what Tiago said, trying to get the institutions on board because you can only build so much from the outside you can only do so much as as one small organization um but if you can bring in those other big stakeholders who can you know leverage far far greater exposure far far greater usage um and try and embed some of those principles into how they think about delivering public services for instance or doing democracy um you, you're going to get far greater returns and more sustainability. Um, so, you know, I get about two or three emails a week from very, very well-meaning people saying, I've got an idea about an app that will fix democracy. Can I talk to you about it? And I, I actually have to say, look, that's nice, but I really don't think you have, you know, I mean, that's a big thing. It, it's, it's far too big a thing to be able to be fixed with an app. And I know people are well-meaning, but a lot of really, really smart people have tried to do these things and failed. Um, what I did, my advice to those people and, and to people kind of just more starting out in the field is pick one thing you think you can fix and not like big world democracy thing, pick one really kind of practical thing that people need that's actually solving an issue for them. My favorite example is m system in Africa. Um, which was born out of, you know, someone observing how people were kind of getting around the issue of not having enough small change, you know, and leaning into that using mobile credit. Um, you know, a, a lot of these answers are actually already out there, maybe in kind of, you know, smaller kind of uncut diamond form, but it, leaning into how people act and, and use technology, I think, is far better than kind of creating something in in a vacuum and then assuming that it will work in the real world as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, uh, Tiago. Um, and so, yeah, I think you're pointing to, you know, you're looking at the global stage, you're seeing the potential, and I think, you know, a lot of insights there. So unfortunately, this is a very, very fast paced event. So we won't be able to, uh, address the questions in the Q&A at this point, but we will be trying to come back to those post events. So one of the unfortunate things about Zoom is we can't all give a big round of applause, but uh, just uh, uh, we can uh, thank them 
and I hope Rebecca and Jag will be staying online. But now we are able to go from the global perspective and move on to the Australian perspective. So we have uh, four speakers, and so we'll speak for around five minutes each, and then we'll have, uh, again, some fairly brief uh, Q&A time. So I'd like to start by inviting uh, Matt Sawkill, who is the Managing Director of Code for Australia, which is an uh, initiative to bring together uh, energy and momentum and software in creating better lives for Australia. So please pass over to Matt. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Matt. <laughs> um, I'd first like to get started just by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm coming to you from, uh, the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. Um, so I'm from Code for Australia. Um, we have the privilege to be one of the first civic tech organisations to start here in Australia. Uh, we've been around since 2014. And while we work here in Australia, we're also part of an international network, uh, which is called Code for All. And that contains about 30 other member organisations um, that share the same values and approach as us. And there's folks like My Society that we're big fans of. We're obviously delighted to have Rebecca joining us tonight. Um, and that international exchange through Code for All, that lets us, I guess, share ideas and collaborate with other teams doing similar work around the world. Um, in the spirit of open source, we're not the sort of people that like to reinvent things and, and do things that are already being done. So if there's an opportunity to take something that's worked elsewhere in the world and try it out here, um, that's a big part of our approach. And we also give a lot back. A lot of our own programs and initiatives have been taken um, from the start here and, and being rolled out in other countries as well. And each of our international member organizations in, in Code for All, they have particular focuses. Um, they might be tackling participatory democracy um, or open data in countries where that's a, a real challenge. Um, here in Australia, our efforts have really been focused on capability building inside government. Uh, we try and bring in practitioners um, from outside government and have them work inside government, build software, demystify how they work, um, show what agile and human-centered design look like in practice, and really demystify some of that stuff for folks in government. Um, we have a pretty simple mission. We just want Australia to have a world-class digital government um, and ultimately one that's designed and built for everyone here. Um, we focus on government primarily because we care about people and government are the agency responsible for helping people in society and can have the most influence at scale. Um, and if you've read the news in Australia um, in, in the recent decades, you know our government doesn't have a great track record of putting people first when it comes to how their IT projects are designed and delivered. Um, Chad talked about challenges with procurement and the history of that earlier. And that's just one of the systems I guess we're trying to disrupt with how we go about our work. Um, what does a, a world-class digital government really mean? Um, there's a great definition from Tom Lusmore, who's part of the Gov UK team, who spoke about using the technologies and the ways of working from the internet era to better meet customer expectations. And that's a big part of it. Um, just, just dragging our friends in government into best practice is pretty important, but ultimately where we want to be is um, at a place where the policies and services that government deliver are designed and driven by the needs of the public themselves. Um, their data and their code and their platforms are, are shared and open. Um, that's one of these things that's not necessarily part of the procurement model to date. And we also think about digital as a way for people to collaborate, just like we're here talking tonight. It's a way to bring people together, um, break down borders, be more inclusive and get people more involved. So it's a great opportunity for the public service to use technology to work more openly and collaborate with each other. Um, here in Australia, there's a lot of complexity to government. We have local, state and federal initiatives so having those teams collaborate a bit more would be great to see. Um, talking about how we go about our work, um, a big principle of ours is to help and not sell. Uh, we operate a bit like a consulting firm might. We come in and we give advice, but ultimately we've succeeded when we're not required anymore, when a team's kind of had their capability built, understands how to go about it, and we can move on to the next people. Um, we also support a, a big community of people here in Australia that want to give back to society, that have some technical skills, um, a lot of people that actually probably weren't born here, but have a bit arrived in Australia as immigrants. I did myself. Um, we've kind of got a lot we can sort of contribute and give back to the people around us. And we want to do that um, using the, the skills that we have. Um, a big thing we do that I guess is important um, is amplifying what's successful inside government already. A lot of teams have had some success, have had some great learnings, tried new methodologies out and things like that. But because of some of the systems in place, like procurement and project management, there's actually a lot of 
infrastructure or social infrastructure in place for them to share what they've learned and help help take their learnings to other teams. So we play a bit of a role in amplifying what's working and, and sharing some of the learnings from projects that didn't go so well um, across, the, across the country. And ultimately, another thing that's big for us um, and it's part of our role in the Code for All Network as well, is just to be a bit of a, a role model organization. Um, we're a 100% digital team. Um, we can sort of demonstrate the attributes of what that looks like in practice and how it works for us and, and share our journey along the way with our friends inside government. Uh, we have three main programs that we use to, to get our work done. Um, the flagship one that you might have heard of is our, our fellowship model. It's basically where we take a, a team of three people and create a little startup team that work inside government. And they do sort of agile delivery, um, they do human centered design. And unlike when government might go to a consulting firm or a vendor to, to have that work done, that work happens entirely inside their teams. So it's a, a way to sort of show them how this stuff happens. Um, we also have programs that help audit digital maturity and readiness to be responsive um, in times like this. Um, and a program called Tech for Non-Tech, which is all about working well with developers to create some harmony inside delivery teams. So that's the history of the organization and what we've been up to to date. Um, what we're doing right now is looking a little bit different, obviously. Um, we're taking a bit of a role in leading community responses to um, the COVID-19 um, situation. We're sort of aligning volunteers with projects they can get involved in and creating a bit of awareness. And we're also reimagining how our work happens. Um, so much of it used to happen around a wall with a post-it note, and now we're having to do it online. So we're sharing a lot of our learnings back from that. Um, if you want to find out more about what we're up to, um, our website, codeforaustralia.org. Um, we've got a blog on there where we're sharing a lot of our work. Um, we've got a Slack community. You're, you're all invited to join. So jump in there and say hi. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Really inspiring uh, organization and uh, already achieved a lot and obviously uh, up to achieve far more. Just remind everybody to please uh, put in your questions in the Q&A section. We'll be having the four presenters and then coming to a bit of the discussion from there. So I'd like to hand over now to Amelia Loy, who is the, of course, the founder and managing director of Engage2 and also the founder and executive director of the Center for Civic Innovation. Amelia Loy. Thanks, Russ. Hi, everybody. Great to have you here. And thank you all to all the speakers who have said yes to our request for participation. Um, well, firstly, I'll just talk very briefly about the Engage2. We help government engage, understand and work with community. So we cover off on a lot of what Tiago and Beck have been talking about, which is um, picking the right tools and methods for engagement. Uh, for government and also really trying to institutionalize better practices, processes and systems uh, so that we can actually listen to and understand the community being more responsive to them as government. Um, but I think community engagement is a hell of a lot more broad than that and that's why I founded the Centre for Civic Innovation which is very focused on powering people-led change. So a lot of the engagement processes that we've talked about so far today are very focused on government driven change and citizens, community members participating in government decision making processes and trying to influence them. So at the Centre for Civic Innovation, we think that it's pretty common for people to want to do good in their community and we don't want them to do good at their expense. So we're really focused on being a bit of a sounding board for everyday uh, citizens, everyday people in our communities to share their ideas, to bounce them off people who are specialists in entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, uh, innovation, civic technology, uh, and then have some support to actually really maximize their social impact, social and economic impact. Um, yeah, so we've, we've really uh, been pleased to see a lot of the responses to COVID, the DIY masks and ventilators, um, just people helping out their elderly neighbours, uh, the use of open data that's, that's been happening. Uh, and in my community here in Manly, there's even our innovation network has even pivoted and are now actually operating like a charity and delivering um, a free service to the local cafes and restaurants helping them get online uh, in a very, very cost-effective way so that they can actually um, deliver their services without having to go through some of those more expensive processes and services. So 
I guess the purpose of us uh, working on this event is uh, recognising that there's been this huge movement of civic innovation and civic technology around the world globally and that, you know, as Rebecca and Tiago said, it, it could be better supported and I think it's time for us to really look at how we strategically scale the, the development of these initiatives, encourage and scale the development of these initiatives and really look at what that investment in people-driven change looks like and how we um, deliver that in, at a, in, a, in a broader way where it actually intercepts with our institutions and makes a really, really significant difference. So our focus at the Centre for Civic Innovation is really looking at kind of stimulating the development of that civic tech, cultivating um, those civic innovators and helping them find their pathways, whether their solution be tech, service oriented, a product, or really if they're just starting a community organisation. We don't have any interest in activism. Uh, we, it's about bureaucracy. And we're really trying to work with government on some of the social procurement pieces of things and also uh, encouraging them to work with community as well. Awesome. Thank you, Amelia. Uh, you're always, a, always an inspiration and uh, pointing the way for all of us. So some great insights there. So I'd like to uh, go ask Nigel Abbott who's the founder of Fundition, which is an equity crowdfunding platform. Over to you, Nigel. Thank you very, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And yes, uh, Amelia, I'm in your neck of the woods in Manly. What a beautiful spot. Um, so yeah, I'm a director of Fundition, which is an equity funding platform. Um, and basically the way that works is that um, we sort of operate under the corporation's law and within that there is what they call the crowd, I'm going to take my glasses off, crowdsource funding legislation, which came about in around 2018. Um, and the idea was really to marry up uh, potential investors and the real game changer is retail investors. And that really is, you know, everyone in the marketplace has the opportunity to invest in um, private companies or unlisted public companies um, to provide capital funding so that those businesses can reach their full potential. Um, there's no sort of um, minimum around being a startup or sort of a, a very well established business. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an insight as into the legislation and regulation and, and how it works. So what we'd be looking at here is from a civic tech perspective, is you know being able to support and fund some of these companies um, from a private company perspective. Obviously, non for profits, etc., that operates under a sort of different regulatory regime than what we do. Um, now, obviously, the government um, looked at what was happening in the UK, very successful over there, um, and in the US as well. In fact, we're launching in the US very shortly under another sort of uh, regulatory environment um, to create a trans-Pacific model. Um, but the government, you know, wanted to make sure that, you know, um, businesses in Australia had another channel of funding, not just debt from the banks, et cetera, which is very difficult, or under the sort of um, uh, pre-existing what they call Section 708, which is you could only really get funding from sophisticated investors. And that became difficult. So the government decided that, well, people, anyone could go and invest in these companies. Now, we have um, an Australian financial services licence that allows us to operate this platform. So just think of it quite simply. One side, you have issuers or private companies wanting to raise capital. And on the other side, you have investors. And they could be what we call retail investors everyone or a sophisticated investor which means uh, meets certain criteria. Um, so what I'll do is just give you a little bit of an insight as to how this works because if you have a company um, and say you're creating an app or some technology um, and you need funding for that then you know getting your head around this and how the mechanics work for you this could be um, a possible channel of uh, capital raising for you so one side you've got the issuers the private companies 
they have to be under $25 million revenue or $25 million in net assets. They can actually raise, they have to be domiciled here in Australia, they can raise up to 20, sorry, $5 million a year, as long as they're under that um, benchmark or that cap. Um, and they could actually do two raises a year, two million, and then follow them with three. But they can only raise five million dollars a year. Now that's quite a large amount of money. Um, on the flip side, with the investor, um, you basically a retail investor is allowed to put up to ten thousand dollars into a company per year. So let's say that that company's maybe did two raises or one raise in a year, they're only allowed to put $10,000. So that's the government's way of, I guess, de-risking it because obviously investing in these unlisted companies, there is a high risk level and you never know when the liquidity event will come about. So they've capped it at $10,000, but if you're a sophisticated investor, well, you can put in an unlimited amount. So let's say I'm company Nigel Abbott Good Times, I want to raise, I'm, I've created this amazing technology that's going to support the government, and I want to raise, say, you know, $800,000. Well, obviously, I need to go through a, you know, vetting and due diligence process with a platform like ourselves, because we want to make sure that you tick all the boxes, because you're going to be taking on investors' money. You go through that process, let's say you tick all the boxes, you've got your financial modelling right, all of those sort of key components that we look for. Well, then, you know, you create a campaign around your raise and then that goes onto a platform like ours, which we call an intermediary platform. And there's about 10 of them, 10 licences being granted in Australia. And then from there, um, you know, you've got up to 90 days to raise the capital. You set a minimum and you have a maximum. So your minimum might, for instance, be, okay, well, for us to complete our growth strategy, we might need $500,000. But geez, we'd love to have 800000 or 900000 to be able to accomplish our growth phase two. So you set that minimum. It can be up to 90 days, you can make it shorter. But if you, if you reach the minimum, then the raise is deemed successful. Now, there's obviously a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes and ASIC, Australian Securities Investment Commission, they, have, they provide a template of what we call an offer document. And the offer document pretty much covers everything from business model, financial modeling, through to all of the risks. And that's really the the key document um, for your company when you're raising capital so that the potential investor really can, you know, get in and, and, and sort of have a look at all the all, all of the key components and all the dirty laundry and everything um, within that company. And then as I said on the other side, the investor basically can um, pledge the money. So if, 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 if the raise reaches the minimum, will that investor's money they then receive a share certificate and they then have equity in that specific company. And look, in a nutshell, that, that's how it works. It, it's starting to gather momentum in Australia. Um, and I'd certainly like to see that, you know, we see more types of, you know, um, civic tech coming through um, that, you know, can support um, obviously the government, et cetera. Um, and, as, and as well okay, as us. Nigel, I'm sorry, we have to move okay, on from there. Terrific. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'd like to move on to Stephen Rutter, who's the founder of the Scale Institute, which focuses on entrepreneurial education and uh, is also a co-non-executive director of the uh, Centre for Civic Innovation. So over to you, Stephen. Thanks, Ross. Hi there, everyone. Um, so my expertise is not in tech or finance. Thanks, Nigel, but focusing on the problem we're solving. Okay, so the Scale Institute helps businesses create value and communities to amplify initiatives and mindsets that all get underpinned by focusing on people taking action. So how do we actually reward these people to start? Well, I think we need to motivate them first you need to speak to their intrinsic desires for things like autonomy, mastery and purpose. We also need to find ways of rewarding people 
on that moral and emotional level for asking questions, having our community to actually come out and question, devising experiments to learn new things and doing all the hard stuff that's involved in creating these solutions for civic innovation. I want to provide these innovators a freedom to question assumptions, write new rules, but also experiment to learn and even throw themselves into the jaws of failure. So this is really challenging because, you know, we, we come from a culture of actually, you know, of saying no. So not all our community leaders like to admit that they don't know how to proceed. But if we can actually give them a framework um, so they actually know where their end result may be, it's just a road along it might be quite different. So um, with my colleague, Dr. Tim Rayner, who's an entrepreneurial educator at UTS, we've created a startup approach for communities to adopt. The ideology incorporates eight key levers and they provide a framework to create business value by renewing their models. So the eight facets include knowing the most important asset is talent, allowing people to act, solve and grow, embracing a culture willing to fail, opening up operational innovation, leaning on the data for the decisions, and the right decision. Rethinking success metrics, moving beyond reward monetary value, and open innovation equals open in information. So I'll do my best to help you or um, others connect to people that can. So thanks for having me, Ross and Amelia. Take care in this unstable period. Even my internet's probably unstable, but do what you can to start. Fantastic. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you to all of you, to Matt, Amelia, Nigel, and Stephen. So I have to have some uh, Q&A, so I've got a question up. Please add your questions for our extraordinary panelists. Uh, first question uh, goes to Matt. I was interested to learn about your processes for collecting quality data. And of course, there is a balance between um, privacy and getting good data. And this is a you know, significant thing in the whole world of uh, open data, government data, and civic tools. So uh, the question is, you know, essentially, how do you collect data and how do you balance and navigate these issues of privacy and propriety and quality of data? Matt. Yeah, thanks. So we, we deal with data in a couple of contexts at Code for Australia. Um, within our fellowship program itself, where we're sort of designing and building software for government, we're obviously beholden to privacy and security legislation and regulations that they are, and we're sort of big supporters of, I guess, treating user data with, with the respect it deserves. Um, our work tends to be much more uh, qualitative in research. We do a lot of prototyping and experimenting um, we don't do a lot of sort of qualitative data-driven uh, design work. So we're sort of just, I guess, following along with best practices in that context. Um, more broadly, in the advice we give to government, um, we've actually written a, a public submission to the Victorian government's open data policy recently, which you can check out on our blog as a bit of an example of how we think. Um, we really think government could be doing more to make their data available. Um, a lot of what's missing is the metadata, how their data is being used and how often it's being updated. Um, and there could be a lot more put out to that people could find value um, in industry and as individuals. At the same time, privacy concerns are a huge issue. Um, there's been quite a few instances here in Australia where data has been released for a hackathon or a purpose like that. It's meant to have been anonymized and then some researchers have taken a few minutes to find out that it's actually pretty easy to track back through it. So we refer to a few of those case studies when we give advice back to government. I think ultimately we want to see as much data being open and, and shared as practical while still, I guess, having those, those concerns addressed in a way that requires a bit of sophistication. And hopefully um, our friends in government are getting on board with that. So I'd encourage you to sort of um, follow up on our blog post to sort of see what we had to share there. That had a bit of a, a synthesis of research from our broader community as well on some best practices in the space. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, uh, you yeah, know, these are critical issues and great to hear that you've got uh, your uh, on top of those issues. So I suppose pulling together some of the threads which have been raised, and these are around building civic tech, uh, the funding or the financial sustainability, uh, the education that's required. Perhaps Amelia, I can ask you, I suppose, in, in pulling together some of these threads around, what do you think are the critical things in being able to build the financial sustainability and you know that the investment across financial, uh, uh, obviously community involvement and energy and government supports. What do you see is, is critical and on the plate there, uh, Amelia? Thanks, Ross. Uh, that's a big one because I, I look at the full line of sight. I guess like you know you raised education. We need we need some funding. We need to fund organisations that can help people get started. You know, it's one thing to just have an idea um, and say it to government or have an idea and have a test go. But if you really want to scale your impact, you've got to learn how to set up organisations, um, which usually means setting up a not-for-profit or a social enterprise or a business. Um, so, yeah, we're at the Centre for Civic Innovation. We're working on a Cultivate program, which helps people do just that. Figure out what kind of entity should you be um, to really scale your impact so you're not a lone ranger out there trying to make a difference on your own and, and um, doing it in an unsustainable way. Um, so that's probably where I'd start. Um, obviously, that means that we need to have some funding. We're not a charity. It's actually really hard to become a charity if you don't have a specific social issue that you're working on. Um, so we're a bit too general. So it's very hard for us to get that status and start you know, really scaling our impact. So that's definitely something that I hope that government look at. Um, I think that also, you know, it's been mentioned a few times, social procurement, opening up data. There's lots of ways that government can help to stimulate the development of civic innovation, which I think is in their interest because it demonstrates a desire to have people self-service and encourages a, a strong sense of shared responsibility for social problems, hopefully taking a little bit of pressure off them. And um, I thought it was really great to have Nigel on the panel because I think creative methods of like financing and funding the scaling of these initiatives is going to be really critical. And I'm not going to I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag just yet. But there's a couple of announcements that will happen this afternoon, and I really hope that um, we'll see more uh, small and bigger businesses who have capabilities to incubate uh, civic technology and civic innovation and really sort of come on board and, and help us to help other people scale their initiatives. Fantastic, thank you, Amelia. So we want to keep moving. We're obviously start a little bit late and we're trying to get through this packed agenda. And so next we have the World Cafe. And this is going to be a little bit tricky, but I know you're all very smart, so I'm sure we'll be able to uh, work this through. What is going to happen is that in a moment you will get uh, very brief uh, elevator pitches from each of these uh, wonderful people who will tell you just a little bit about your their initiative. You will then be given a series of links. I'll actually go to the instructions here. Give me the World Cafe. So in a moment we'll come up in the chat icon. You will see a list of tables which will be hosted by each of these uh, people. You will click on the link of the table and you will go into a different Zoom meeting. And then for 15 minutes, you will hear some more and be able to have a conversation with the founder of uh, this very, these very interesting civic tech organizations. At the end of the session, then your host will give you again the links to uh, the same set of links and then you will then choose a second group to go into and to listen to the uh, listen to and to engage with these founders, and then 15 minutes for each of these sessions. At the end of these, the host will then give you the link to come back to this uh, Zoom meeting. And please be sure to come back because I think there are the announcements we have to finish off will be compelling for uh, for everyone here. So, I'd like to just go in turn for 30 seconds from each of the speakers in the World Cafe just to be able to just hear in a nutshell what you do, uh, what you'll be talking about, and then uh, quickly go through in turn, and then we'll 
give you the links and you will choose uh, which of the tables you will join uh, for the first and the second sessions. So please, if we can get uh, Julia Sufa up for our first uh, elevator pitch. Awesome, thanks for us. Hi everybody, I'm Julia Sa of Paper Plane. Paper Plane enables property developers, governments and uh, communities to jumpstart community building um, in our growing uh, neighborhoods through coordination and um, community building measurement. Okay, so we'll move on to uh, Brenton Hagen, but uh, just let's just go through directly. I don't need to step in between. So please just go through and that next one, Brenton Hagen. Thank you. Yeah, g'day. Um, look, I, what an incredible um, lineup of speakers today, and I'm really inspired by that. We come from a different angle. We, um, over the last 10 years, have developed the Community Information Exchange. Information is often the most powerful thing and access to data that can be accessible to create the change is absolutely key to social uh, or civic tech. And um, tonight, fundamentally, I wanna talk further about the Civic Tech Institute. My board have agreed to start supporting uh, the development of civic technology. And then most importantly, uh, what that means. So how do we develop a way where people can access information? And I just want to finish with a story and a pitch about my dad. He said, unless you're actually selling things, you're not really in business. And so I want to talk with, uh, if you join out my table today, I want to talk about how do we get civic technology into community organizations and others who actually have money, resources and solve problems because people are prepared to pay for it. So uh, look, I'm keen to see if, uh, I'm keen to see if we can, um, uh, you know, progress that. <laughs> Did Fantastic. I Thank do you. that pitch without unmuting myself or was that okay? That was awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next up is Victor Lee. Hi everyone, I'm Victor and I'm the co-founder of Communitya. Uh, we're a social enterprise and we essentially have a crowdsourcing platform that connects and mobilizes volunteers to, to tackle the world's greatest challenges. Um, essentially, we work with three stakeholder groups, um, corporates, charities, and just everyday individual to do more volunteering and encourage them to do more good. So in my uh, World Cafe today, I'll be exploring two things. So one is to kind of sh share a bit about journey some of the things we stumbled as a startup and the lessons we learned as a um, civic tech startup. And then secondly, um, I actually want to go through a bit more about what people can do in terms of civic participation um, during this COVID-19 period of time. Looking forward to seeing you. Awesome, thank you. And uh, next up is Tom Dawkins, also a non-executive director of the Center for Civic Innovation. Tom, over to you. Yeah, it's all about how you, who you know getting these kinds of invites. <laughs> um, great to be here. Um, so I, in addition to you know, my, my most important hat, being a non-executive director of CCI, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Start Some Good. And we're an innovation agency and capacity builder for social enterprise and social innovation. And our real passion is how we activate and inspire grassroots change makers, particularly those with a lived experience of social challenges to bring their ideas to the table and gain the skills and confidence to go forward with those ideas to make a difference. And so we run a crowdfunding platform, we run a social enterprise design program, we run the world's biggest online event for early stage and emerging social enterprises, which I'll tell you a bit more about at the end. Um, and I wanna talk about how best we can ensure that all voices are heard when it comes to civic tech and social innovation and how we can inspire those who don't yet have the skills around pitching and storytelling and so on to bring their ideas forward and make a difference. Thank you, Tom. That sounds pretty compelling to me. Uh, so next up is another Tom, Tom Workman. Uh, so over to you, Tom Workman. Uh, unfortunately, Tom's been unable to make it. Uh, so we'll move on. Okay. Next up is Leila Callum. Yeah. Leila, do we have you? <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Mute. 
My name is Leila. Uh, I'm a co-founder of a st tech startup called The Access, uh, interested in use of emerging tech for the prevention of onset of chronic disease. My passion and my heart is to use uh, tele, tele collaboration technologies, telehealth, uh, with use of emerging tech to allow people to do more voluntary work. I'm working, uh, I'm originally from Morocco and I'm working with a group in there uh, on the concept of a medical caravan that would allow an, a <coughs> medical doctors and specialist doctors to volunteer uh, in delivering their services in a in poor area, in rural area in Morocco. And my, 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 my hope is to be able to do the similar thing uh, in Australia with the uh, uh, remote and regional area that we really are seeking all those um, specialist health services and do not ha have access to it, have to actually come to cities to, to have them. So if you're interested in telehealth, if you're interested in uh, emerging technologies, if you're interested in how you can use it to deliver uh, those services to people who need it most while um, increasing the capacity of people to volunteer, to do good uh, around them, uh, come to my table. Thank you, Leila. Uh, we have uh, Mel Flanagan up next. Please, Mel. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm a transparency and public participation advocate and maker of open government information services, and I'm also a procurement reformist. Uh, I run a social enterprise in Sydney called Nook Studios and open process is the movement we started in Australia that's gone global. Um, Make Paths is our product um, we're developing. And Make Paths is a transparency and collaboration tool to help people combine data, storytelling and design. And our purpose is to inform and allow communities to participate in government decision making and track things such as mining, natural resource, infrastructure projects, and visualise government financial flows. I'd love to share what we've done already and where we're going, and I'm really interested to hear what um, open process stories other people are interested in. Fantastic. Thank you, Mel. And to round up, last one of the uh, little uh, pictures is coming from Dane Murray. Dane, thanks. Hi folks, I'm Dave Murray from environment.vote. It's an online civic space that uses transparent met methodology to assess policies of election candidates in order to uh, provide voters with data to make informed decisions. It was developed for the last federal election to help people understand party policy related to climate change. Environment.vote is designed to give people choice, to educate people on preference voting, and to guide people to make safe choices that are aligned with their own personal values. Launched just before the last federal election, that had over half a million page views, and the data, analysts, data analysis indicates that the most viewed uh, electorates are related to the highest swings in the results. Uh, in my breakout, I'll be sharing the data for the very first time. Uh, so if this interests you, or you want to help us scale this for future elections, Click on the link to environment.vote and come and join me. Fantastic. Thank you. So we, just to reiterate the, um, the instructions. So in a moment, we'll have the links to each of the rooms. Uh, so we'll have 15 minutes with your host. You'll have conversation. The host will then give you the links to the next room. And you will then be given a link to come back to round out and get the final announcements driving the future of civic tech. Um, so do we have the links? Here we go. So scroll up, scroll down, find the one you want, get in and look forward to seeing you back in 30 minutes. Got some announcements, uh, some very exciting things. Uh, those who are passionate about the civic tech space and doing things to support that. So we've got a number of announcements to be able to, uh, for all of us, in terms of being able to drive that moving forward. So starting with uh, Brenton, I'd like to hear from you on uh, what you, you have to share with the audience. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, look, there's two specific things that we're really passionate about. One, we are establishing the Civic Technology Institute with a formal launch in July. So if you're interested in participating in establishing that in terms of governance, ideas, networks, uh, you're very, very um, welcome to join us, number one. Uh, the second thing is uh, we are offering from today on uh, anyone developing civic technology access to our APIs and our database. So this means community information uh, services and clubs and events across Australia because without an access and supply to information, it's very, very difficult to create civil, civic technology. So we're offering access to a, our data, B, our staff and our expertise and C, to any technology you need. And we're looking for partners in that because ideally that will happen through, um, a, you know, joint hosting. But there's A, the ability to become part of establishing the civic technology. P private message me, reach out, email. We're looking for ways of establishing that. We want to start the civic technology formally not just online, but having presences across Australia from July 1. And then secondly, if you have an idea that can change the world, you need a market. We've got 27,000 people that are actively involved. And secondly, um, if you need to pitch, prototype, support, and get um, in front of community organisations that will drive civic technology in the future, we're pleased to uh, contact and we'll provide access to that. Fantastic. Thank you, Brenton. Uh, that's very generous. And uh, in the spirit of what we're doing, that's an extraordinary resource for the community. Thank you. Over to Tom Dawkins of Start Some Good. Tom. Hey, I just wanted to invite everyone, you know, those of you who enjoy this kind of getting together and having important conversations online thing, I'd love to invite you to come and check out and participate in our Starting Good Virtual Summit, which is taking place next month. We're expecting about 10,000 participants in that. I believe it's the world's biggest um, online gathering of early stage and aspiring social entrepreneurs. And it's all about starting good things. So it's all about community driven uh, projects, initiatives and enterprises for change. So you can find out more at www.starting.gd. Thank you, Tom. Sounds, uh, sounds exciting. So we'll move on to Ben Peterson from IBM with a very interesting announcement. Thank you very much, Ross, and, and uh, thank you so much for the invite, Amelia. A couple of quick things, actually. Um, the, the first one is um, a, a program that we're running uh, currently called Call for Code, which is a, a global program um, aimed at um, unleashing innovation and technology to help solve uh, some of the, the, the biggest challenges facing the earth. It's in its third year now, but the previous two years we were, were looking at um, natural disasters. And last year we had over 200,000 developers uh, take part uh, globally. So one of the largest hack um, and technology programs globally. Um, you probably guess what uh, what the theme is this year. Yes, it's it's COVID. So I'm um, looking to, to, you know, we've kicked that off already. So um, please um, Google call for code. We've got a number of virtual hackathons here in Australia. We've got some great people to support you. First prize is $200,000 US, which is what, about 500K AU at the moment. So great first prize. And we also help to implement your solution. So uh, with governments and, and with, um, with other organizations. So that's first announcement. Second announcement. Um, you may already be aware of the IBM um, startup program. It's a global program as well. We, we run it here locally. We're actually going to be uh, kicking off a, a civic tech specific incubator um, because we've got some amazing um, civic tech uh, startups, including yourself. So um, we've got a great program um, happening. We're going to be um, onboarding um, at least one lucky civic tech um, startup onto our program. It gives you um, at least four weeks, uh, four hours a week of um, tech mentoring for, with uh, some of our amazing technologists. Gives you um, between $1,000 and $10,000 a month US, again, which is you know, big, of uh, access to IBM Cloud Tech. So that's everything from blockchain, all of the Watson capabilities, all of the cloud storage, um, the, the data analytics, et cetera. So all of that great stuff. And then if your solution is, is amazing, we can actually onboard you into the IBM Partner Program and have your solution available through our online marketplaces and in the IBM catalog for IBM sellers to, to offer our government clients, et cetera, and for partners as well. 
So um, the uh, information will be distributed soon, um, but um, yeah, looking forward to working with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. And it's fantastic that uh, IBM recognizes the importance and the value of Civic Tech in supporting that. So uh, Gala Victor's not in the room, so we are going to pass over to Amelia. So I, to be my honor and delight to be, uh, oh, Victor, we've got Victor. Please, over to you, uh, if you have an announcement for us. Hi, sorry, thank you. Made it just in time, so I ran over, over time. Um, so my name is Victor Lee, um, we're from Communitya. I just want to share some kind of learnings from the last uh, few weeks and few months around the COVID-19. Um, so we work with uh, just over 700 different charities and um, the, the way we get it is that the community is really going through a very challenging time. Um, people are becoming more socially isolated and those who were already isolated before the crisis have become even more so. Uh, despite this, um, we a community really sees an opportunity to engage those who are what we call temporarily isolated. So people working from home, um, people who might have a bit of spare time on their hands and really mobilize and connect with them so that they can actually go and help charities who are servicing the what we call long term isolated. So I'm talking people um, about um, people in HK facilities, uh, people with disabilities, migrants and refugees, and people with mental health issues. Um, so one of the announcements we want to make is Community is uh, about to launch a campaign called Virtually Together. And what we want to do is build an online community that connects those who are the most vulnerable and isolated. Um, we're going to work with corporates and local councils to mobilize resources um, and redistribute them through virtual volunteering and online activities to assist the charities involved and in part help the general wider community. Um, and with your help, we want to attract more organizations and more people to really take up on this social movement. And for a crowdsourcing platform like ours, uh, more people equals more impact. So if you're interested, please uh, reach out. I'm, uh, I'll work with the, the, the community to see whether we can send some more information through. Um, we've already got uh, two councils on board, uh, City of Sydney and Parramatta, and we've got three corporates who have already signed up their staff to do this. So we, we see this as a long-term engagement um, and we really want to kind of use technology to tackle social isolation um, over the next kind of six to 12 month period. So I look forward to working with you and uh, amplify our collective impact. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. A very uh, pertinent initiative today uh, in these challenging times. So I want to hand over to uh, Amelia Moy the executive director of the Center for Civic uh, Innovation, who's uh, set this uh, event up. So uh, it's been my honor and pleasure to uh, host and to try to facilitate this event. Uh, so I'll hand over now. Thank you, uh, Amelia, over to you to view your final announcements and to wrap up the event. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ross. Uh, you've done a wonderful job. And I also want to recognize and thank Samantha um, who stepped in to help produce this event when it was postponed because we couldn't have it face to face because of COVID. We, were, we thought we were being creative techie wise by having a virtual panel uh, of global experts. Uh, we're, we're, being, we're zooming in at the time. Um, but yeah, thank you for everyone for your patience and how we've hacked Zoom to try to be a bit creative and keep our costs down as a not-for-profit currently we're still working on our revenue model and getting creative about that but we're we think we're pretty close to, to nailing um, what we offer as a service and uh, Layla asked me a question in the chat about that so uh, we'll share that after the event on our www.centercivicinnovation.org news page and we'll also share answers from the other panelists uh, to the questions that were asked. Tiago has even sent me through a very comprehensive answer to John Asquith's question. So I think that's going to be quite a thing to watch. Um, you can register for updates on that page. Um, yeah, we'll also be providing an update about our Cultivate program, which I'm working with Stephen Rudder on. So the board members are Stephen Rudder, Tom Dawkins, Ross Dawson and Kerry Graham, who runs Collaborate for Impact, but unfortunately couldn't be with us here tonight. Um, probably because she's working on some really big complex social issues as a result of COVID. 
Um, so yeah, Ross said he feels honored and privileged. Uh, I am just so pleased to have such a wonderful group of people supporting uh, me and this organization. And uh, if anybody else on this call wants to get involved in helping us build uh, what we're doing and helping civic innovators to maximize their social impact, we'd really love to hear from you about how you can help us scale our impact as well. So you can get in touch with me also through that website. Um, thanks everyone. I'm seeing a few things popping up on the chat. Uh, if you did have problems as a founder in your group uh, with people coming, I would be really happy for you to share a small video with me uh, that we can share on our, on that, also on that news page, or perhaps we could set up a time for an interview. Thanks again, everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful dinner. Uh, if you have any questions, just shoot us through a question on the, on the website.